is that you want to create a seal between the glaze, the glazing and the glass. Uh, like, and so if you're glazing, so I have a piece of glass out. So I'm gonna meander over on the side. So um maybe if you can't see this particularly well. Let's see if I can change the angle. Maybe if I didn't have tools all over here, it might be a little easier for you. Um sorry, it's difficult. Um So I don't know if you can see kind of this edge right here, but this is like the kind of the flat piece. And so what you want to do is you have the glazing, but then you have, and the glazing generally when you glaze, you want the glaze to be just inside the, you just want it to be just slightly less than the width of the rabbit that it sits in. And so it has like this little L shape that you can kind of see here, this white, oh, this white part um, where you can see the wood and it's like this little L-shaped ledge that the glass sits in. Um, so you just want your glazing to be slightly less thick than that. You do not want to see your glazing. If you flipped your window over when you were reglazing, you don't want to see your glazing. By leaving it slightly less than the thickness of this rabbit, it then gives you just enough space to paint a little bit onto the glass, like a sixteenth of an inch onto the glass, maybe even less sometimes, but a sixteenth of an inch onto the glass. And that way, what you're doing is you're sealing the putty in. And so when I talked about the, when the putty is separated from the wood, so that defeats the purpose because the putty is no longer sealed in uh, next, to the, next to the wood. And so it's not actually providing the sealed in protective coating anymore. So similarly, if you didn't paint just that sixteenth or just that little tiny strip onto the glass, what that'll allow is for water to actually infiltrate under there and to um, destabilize the glazing or I guess undermine it. It might fail because of that, because of the water infiltration. Um, so I hope, if not, I can show you again when we can, when we do some of the glazing process and everything. So from here, we have our lovely piece of glass out. <clears throat> which still has a little bit of um, glazing on it. And so from here, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, glass cleaning. Okay, so I'm going to set this here and go grab the cleaning supplies, which is going to look a little weird, but it's for a reason. Okay, so this is, this is part of what I use for glass cleaning. Yeah, we can just this all is done. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is my tub that I've chosen. <laughs> And the reason for this is that often you, or in some cases, you'll have glass that'll have pieces of glazing that are just really, really stuck to it. Um, and I think I have an example here. So if you take a look at this piece of glass, you can see along its edge is a giant strip of glazing that has remained attached. And it's relatively hard. And like I said, you want to pry it off, but you want to kind of gently remove that. Um, and so one option for like grip that's really tough and it's really stuck on is that you find yourself a tub that is big enough to hold your piece of glass. And I mean, if you have regular divided light or something like that, it's gonna be easier. Um, this tub's not even big enough, I think, for the piece of glass I'm looking at, so I'm not gonna show. But what I do is I'll place my glass inside of the tub and I'll put it, it basically just use a little dish soap like just soapy water, let that soak for a while. And then from there, you're gonna take your handy dandy razor again. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna gently scrape it off and you're just super gentle. This is something you have to be careful because it's super easy to, um, it's gonna be super easy to um, scratch your glass if you're not careful with it. So just take your time, which you'll probably hear me say a few more times. Um, so, for the piece of glass that we do have, because it's not, it's, it's not bad, um, um, 
you can kind of see there's a little glazing that you can kind of pop off gently on with your hand. Um, but I think part of what uh, is important is that it actually has a little bit of paint left on it. And before we bed it and do that, because we want to paint slightly onto the glass again, we're going to want to take that paint off so that the new paint can adhere properly. So this is my favorite cleaning product. Also, I learned recently that you can clean tiles and microfiber couches with it, which I don't know why that amused me as much as it did, but you know. Um, so one of the other little helpful tools that I find, <clears throat> so if you need to scrub a little bit, sometimes that's useful when you use the, the bin method. Um, but other times, sometimes when I'm worried about scratching glass or anything like that, this is just like a little microfiber, like scrubby pad that I found at Goodwill. And it actually works great. Or you can use um, different towels or a microfiber towel and everything like that. Um, you can use paper towels sometimes, but I don't find those quite as effective. So I like to just give a little spritz. And what I try to do, um, I use my hands, but not everybody likes touching cleaning product. Um, but I just want to get a little bit of that um, Windex right along the edge. So it starts just softening up like that paint along it. And so I'm just kind of working it. And so you can see here, like if I had time in a bigger bucket, that letting it sit in soapy water, warm soapy water for a little bit will loosen that paint up really easily. Um, this is kind of like a quicker method, um, or if you don't have and can't find a larger thing to fit your glass. Um, so. And uh, the one thing I don't know is that like the glass that we take out, I, I know where this piece of glass goes. But say you have a project and you have a divided light window with like six different pieces of glass. Glass can actually be um, cut to size in some cases. And so what's really important and part of the documentation process is um, being careful about labeling your things. You can take a Sharpie. Well, most of the time you can take a Sharpie and write on this, especially the new glass. And what it does is you can just wipe it off after. But other thing is I just use blue tape and just put the blue tape on there. You just wanna keep track of where your materials are coming from. Just like Scott said in that extraction video, he's labeling the different pieces of wood he's taking out. So he's not leaving, you know, he's not leaving that wood unlabeled for later when you know, you're doing three windows and you go, I have no idea which window this stop is for. It's better to keep the, the same stops with the same windows, same glass with the same windows. So, so yeah, keep track of it, mark it. I mean, if, it's, if you're redoing all of the windows in your house, then you can actually get by little wood stamps almost, uh, you, wood stamps. Basically there are these metal pieces with like different numbers. And you can number your windows and they forever will know which window goes where and which piece of wood goes where. Um, otherwise, what I've done is you take a little Sharpie and kind of make a little note on the back of each piece of wood where it doesn't see, not where people can see it, underneath the back side. We have a couple more questions. Then, um, Jane asked that they remove the putty um, and underneath the putty, there are occasionally spots that have like the black staining. And so she's wondering if that's possibly mold or rot and how to treat it. Ah, uh, so, so one of the traditional methods, uh, so I don't know, because I can't see kind of what the black looks like. However, so windows, one of the traditional window colors that was often used was black paint. And so you sometimes go to historic plate homes and, and older homes and you'll actually, when you remove the paint, you'll find black paint at the very base. And so one thing to also know is that, so what I'm gonna recommend for treating the rabbit is what I use. It's like a kind of a newer method and everything. However, at one point in time and other window restorationists will paint, well, they'll prime the rabbit of the window before they glaze. And so maybe it's mold because I don't know kind of exactly what it looks like. I can't tell you, but if it looks like more like a stain or a paint or, or something like that, it could be. It could be that when the, if it hasn't been restored before that that is part of the original paint that was used and that's what they put on before glazing the window. So that's my long 
long non-answer answer to that question. I'm just working my way around. Um, like I said, just being really careful, trying to remove as much as possible. Um, Erica asked about her interior windows. Um, she says the bottom parts of the upper frames are separating from their sides. Mm. So the windows don't line up between the upper and lower sash. Um, what's the best way to reattach or adhere the separated parts? Uh, so the lower rail of your top sash is separating. Yeah, so if that if it's at that point and you're having separation, what I would say is it's best to take that, so take both windows out, do an assessment, but what might need to happen is um, you might need to repin your um, sash joints, so the corners. Um, this is, I don't know if you have locked in your corners of them or why they're separating, but sometimes if the nail or, nail or other pin, which can be a wood pin erodes, then, um, then what you can do, what will happen is that that joint is no longer being held together because they're not glued. So one critical thing about a uh, double hung sash uh, with mortise and tenons and things like that is that they're actually meant to be taken apart so they can be restored and maintained. Um, and so you can knock those pins out yourself with a um, with a um, just like a thinner um, oh my goodness nail set that you can hammer and hammer the nail back out the back. Um, if they're really stuck or the other side is finished, you can actually kind of drill it out with a hollow bit and then kind of plug that up with wood epochs. Um, and so, so anyways, so basically what you want to do is you're going to take that upper sash out and you want to determine if it's deteriorating, like if you have rot or deterioration that means those joints, those uh, mortise and tenons are falling apart or are they falling apart just because the pin has become unstable or gone away. Um, um, and so you kind of just need to determine that. And so putting them back together, um, and when you put a sash together, what I find extremely useful are furniture clamps. And so these are, these are, you know, these kind of, I think some people call them bar clamps maybe, but they're really long, just like, uh, a, oh my God. <laughs> My brain is shut off. Um, just like a, a rod with like clamps on it. And then you can, what you do is you put it up the clamps and you can kind of bring it back together slowly. Like you kind of bring it back in by like tightening the clamp. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of um, good ways to describe that. But part of that is like, if it's been separated for a while, it may have gotten different stuff in between at that point. I, I would often say that it's worthwhile to take the glazing putty and paint off just so you really can see what's happening. Otherwise, like you don't really know why it's separating or how to kind of fix it properly. So I guess that's what I would say um, is that you want to take the glazing and paint out and then take those clamps. Like if the wood is intact and it just needs to be repinned, you take those clamps and bring it back together. Use a square to make sure that it's, it's square and that it's, uh, um, the right, um, I guess, configuration because you don't want to accidentally put it in, what is it, as a parallelogram instead of a square, and then kind of end up having issues putting it back into place. Um, yeah, it's a little hard to, it's kind of hard to describe because it can be a little complicated taking apart the window sash, but it's definitely doable. I would take it out before it starts to degrade more because if it's separating, the water is going to start getting in there more and the damage is only going to kind of increase over time. So, um, Erica also asked, the, she said the finish has worn off of most of the sash, so, um, and the wood is dry. She's asking about the best products for reconditioning or refinishing. Yeah, so if, I don't know how many times I can say it depends if other people might question the integrity of the things I say. Um, but it depends. Uh, so I don't know what the original finish on your window was, but in terms of reconditioning your wood, you have a couple different options. And so one of them um, is like, I kind of mentioned this before for conditioning the rabbit, is that you use a boil, one-to-one -one boiled and seed oil and turpentine mix. And so when you do that, you're going to 
want bare wood. And if the wood, wood is bare um, and you kind of have prepared the surface, you're gonna kind of brush it on rather liberally and it's gonna soak into the wood. And you're gonna do that until you kind of see it, so like not soaking in. And you don't want to, to have to pool on top. You don't want it to be shiny. And so if you start seeing it shiny, then what you're gonna just do is take a rag and wipe it off. And that way, um, moisture and kind of um, moisture and everything else will be kind of brought back to the wood. But also because of the linseed oil and turpentine, it's actually protect acting as a preservative. So also kind of keeping your um, glass from potentially uh, your glass your wood from uh, sucking in just water. So instead, it's sucking in the turpentine linseed oil mix, which is going to condition your wood. Um, the reason you don't want it to pool because linseed oil will become kind of a hard, you can use it as a finish, actually. Um, if you, I, I do believe I've heard more often if you want to use linseed oil as your finish that you do a one-to-one -one mineral oil, mineral spirits, and um, linseed oil mix. Um, a lot of furniture makers will use it as, as a finish and everything. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, there's a bunch of different finishes, whether you have, um, you might have, um, that was snow, sorry. <laughs> um, you might have a shellac, which is made out of beetle poop. And you might have just a regular stain or a lacquer. Um, if you're down to bare wood and that finish is gone, then you kind of have a little bit of free reign of choice and everything. But make sure when you're conditioning that you're not allowing it to pool because if you allow it to pool as its own finish, then it might make it more difficult to refinish it with another material. So, so at this point, we have a <clears throat> mostly clean piece of glass. Um, and so, and it's kind of like to, to wipe it off, um, get those little pieces off and everything. Um, so that's pretty good. That's looking pretty sweet. So the paint on the back side is not as important because what we're doing for this one is that it gets pushed in, it gets pushed down and into the, the glazing putty. However, I'm going to try to at least scrape the major majority of it off because I don't want to see it when I'm looking through the window. And so if I can avoid having to do that and looking at it all the time, I probably will. Um, okay, 11.35. Perfect, then I'm, I'm going to try more quickly because I really do want to show you a couple other things. Um, we have another question from Karen. If that's yes, okay. please. Um, so Karen says her old storm windows have that old black paint. Yes. Um, is that type of paint still available so we can keep the traditional color after we do the repairs? And what type of paint do you recommend? Ooh, yeah, let's talk about this now because I want to maybe not have some later. Um, so yes, paint is great and complicated. Um, but so like I said, um, paint has traditionally been made from different materials, but one of the more traditional materials, uh, one of the more traditional bases was plant oils or like uh, natural oils. And, you know, in the Midwest and in the United States, often that was linseed oil or flaxseed oil. Um, and so there are companies that still make that product today. So I don't know if yours was linseed oil or something else because other kind of different organic oils were used. Um, but there are ones that were. I think that um, the one that I've used the most in different projects um, is, I do believe it's Viking um, paint. And they really primarily just make traditional colors. So they make black. I think they will special make paint, um, but they make that linseed oil paint and I've heard pretty good things about, about their style of paint. Um, there's, I think another one is Allback, which they make a linseed oil paint and a linseed oil putty, a glazing putty. Um, still, um, if you're thinking about it, um, I think there's actually a lot of different um, restorationist, and I didn't include this on kind of the resource list, but they do have um, <clears throat> like whole guides about choosing historic paint colors. Um, and black is very traditional. Um, so I would say if it's black, 
you're going to be able to find the black that kind of matches. If you want to go with the linseed oil paint, you totally can. I think you'll probably have to order online or look kind of for a more specialty store and everything. Um, yeah, I wonder if that's, um, so yeah, so I would say that would probably be it. Um, but I guess like the little bit more discussion about, um, about paints is that um, a lot of like more traditional, quote unquote traditional, restorationists will use like um, they'll use a oil based or like linseed oil based um, putty and paint. However, um, the paint market is like drastically changed. And in some places, depending on where you live, you might not be able to get certain items or certain types. Um, and so there's also acrylic paint, which has come out as very good and having a high quality acrylic paint can be really beneficial, um, especially for exteriors. It can last pretty well. Um, and so there are places that make new paint, like new, I guess they have more contemporary paint composition and materials it's made out of, but they make historic paint colors. Um, so yeah, I hope that, I hope that answers your question. Um, I think I maybe did put Viking paint on there as like uh, an example. So you, that should be on the resource list as well, um, because that's a more traditional use. Besides that, it sometimes ends up being it ends up being a uh, personal preference. But I will say there are no nos of painting, and one of those is uh, trying to paint oil based paint over latex paint because. Uh, it's a water-based paint versus an oil-based paint, and oil and water do not work together. They um, are just going to, one is going to cause the other to just fail. But uh, the oddity is that painting latex over oil generally works better. But if you can paint oil over latex, if you properly prime and um, prepare the surface first. So that's the one thing I would say. It's like, if you were paint, if you're, um, the sash has been previously painted, maybe consider what kind of paint has been previously used. So, but if you're going down to bare wood, then you kind of have free range of what you want to use. Okay, I'm, what I'm doing right now, taking my handy dandy razor tool, like I said, will come pop up in so many different circumstances. Um, and just uh, quickly taking out the rest of the base. Um, I'm gonna dust off the rabbit. So there is less dust kind of in this section. What I'm going to do now is prepare this rabbit for um, putting glazing down. And so what I'm going to do is show you. Um, um, so like I said, um, there's a couple different ways. Um, I've treated my rabbits with um, oil, linseed oil and um, mineral spirits mix one to one ratio a turpentine and uh, linseed oil one-to-one -one mix and put that down. But another really great one, I mean, is um, Penetrol. And I've used it in a couple of circumstances. Here we go, Penetrol. Um, and it's, it's generally worked really well and then you don't have to mix things. I'm gonna use that in this case because I'm not going to take more time to mix things. They generally work pretty well. Um, if you're using a linseed oil base, using a linseed oil um, in your rabbit might actually the oils will kind of polymerize together and hold that putty in a little bit better. But this one is still does a great job of protecting and preparing the rabbit. That was more difficult than I thought. Um, so here's another little tool item um, that will go on the list. But these are just little disposable brushes, but they're a little bit better than just kind of other disposable brushes. I'm just going to take that little brush um, and I'm just going to kind of do like an initial little coat along this rabbit edge. And the one thing I do, I do know that I didn't show you how to do paint removal, but it wouldn't have been really that exciting with the type of paint that's on here right now. Um, but really what you do is kind of similar to the, um, similar to the glazing, um, where you're going to hold it on, but you, I often look for the, um, I look for the um, paint to bubble a little bit because that's when you know it's kind of like lost it. And then you take that scraper that I showed you with the vacuum on and you kind of scrape gently along it. 
if it's really difficult to paint or you have so many layers, you may have to go layer by layer. Um, and uh, what I have found is that this pro scraper works phenomenal, phenomenally and also just not having to do the paint, soaking up the paint afterwards is also quite worth it. Um, so I'm just gonna go around, get this done. So, so this wood seems pretty good. It doesn't really need much conditioning. It's not looking overly weathered, which is good. I'm just gonna make sure that I kind of get into these nooks and crannies. Um, so yeah, so if it's really gray, it's really dry, um, you're going to have to do the work to kind of um, condition it and everything. But in this case, because it's not like overly dry, um, I'm just doing kind of a light coating on it. So in terms of glazing, and I also don't know which one I opened. Okay, this was the right one. <laughs> um, so in terms of glazing, um, so I go with a linseed oil-based glaze. This is a very traditional type glaze. And so this is Sarko's <clears throat> Type M Multi-Glaze. And I'm gonna just show you right here. Uh, we'll have it linked, actually ordering it. Uh, you can order it on Amazon, which is great. Um, I'm gonna take my ring off before I do this. So I uh, don't kind of get too messy, but uh, the method I'm gonna show you is a relatively quick method, but to do this part, I often put on gloves. And the reason I do that is uh, it can get rather messy and it will stick to your hands for days. But one of the really great things that I have, and maybe now I can grab it, is like the cherry bomb. Um, I don't know, it's a cherry bomb with soap. It's red. Maybe I didn't bring it in, um, which is fine. Yes, that. <laughs> cherry bomb. So, which is missing its top for some reason. So, but it, this is some of the best stuff to take off things off your hands, whatever it is. It's in a lot of different shops and different stuff. So what I'm doing right now is I just took a wad of like glazing putty, right? Um, I like to mix it up a little bit in case it's right out, but what I, you can kind of do, there's different methods. I've also put little links in there so you can see people's different methods. But um, one option is that, where is it? Of course, I set things down and then they're gone forever. Ah, uh, there it is. Um, so one option is that you can take like a little bit on your putty, putty knife or and things like that. And I like to really push it in. You want it to be really pressed in there because what we're doing is preparing this to bed the glass. And so like this, I just kind of put a little bit along the edge, but you want to make sure that this putty is all the way around the edge because what you're doing is that bottom part of the putty that the glass is sitting on is going to allow the, it to be like have more waterproof. So it's going to make sure that water is not getting in um, uh, inside the pane of glass. So I'm just gonna work my way around. Um, um, another kind of like other way, like some people just like to push it in with their thumbs. It just depends on what you like. This is another one of those things that like is really up to personal preference. You can even take it kind of like along your thumb. So if you have a little space, you can take it along your thumb and kind of just, it's almost like you're palming it and you press it in and just make kind of like a little snake layer. But I don't have a lot of space on this table. So I'm just gonna press it in like this. So this is like, this is probably one of the mess, well, depending on who you are, this is one of the messier parts of, um, of the glazing process and everything. So, but I'm gonna try to move quickly so y'all can see like the other technique. Because this is this is all like a little bit like, there's not a lot of finesse in doing this part of it. Um, it's really just kind of getting the glazing in, making sure that it's sticking. If you find this glaze is not sticking to your wood very well, it could be for a number of reasons. So if you conditioned your wood, and you treated your wood, you could, it may not be soaked in enough. It may be too wet, and that's going to cause this glaze to fall off. If your um, if your wood is too dry, it could also mean that it's not adhering very well. Um, and partly why you want to condition these rabbits and put something down first is that if you don't, then the oil in this putty is going to um, soak into the wood and is going to prematurely dry 
dry out and also can cause your glaze to fail over time. So that's one of the reasons we treat the, the wood is so that we don't have that issue. Okay. So Karen asked, um, instead of penetrol, could you use permanizer plus as a wood conditioner? I have no idea what that is. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I have no idea. I've never heard of that before, but maybe. Um, Normally what I do is like, if I have all the glass out of different places, I'll hang all of the, I'll hang this open part over the edge so that it makes it a little bit easier to insert um, the, the glazing putty and everything. So, making a mess. Okay. So, I'm just gonna finish this up quick so I can kind of get this um, glass bedded for you all to see. Um, and honestly, so this might feel like really difficult to do, like all of this kind of like the puttying and everything and, and glazing, but honestly, like give yourself a little bit of practice and I promise like you're, you're going to find it's going to get a lot easier over time. So. This is one of those things that I think anybody, oh, so sticky. Okay, just about there. So really, I just don't want any gaps on this bottom part. So, so that should do it for kind of this section. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift my glass and um, place it kind of gently on top of all this. And try not to get glazing on the work. Okay, so. I missed that bottom part in my. I missed the entire bottom part just in case. Y'all are like yelling at me on the screen. <laughs> We're off screen, one of those. They can't see that part, so they oh, have yeah, no, no idea that I just missed this entire section. <laughs> you never would have known. Um, anyways, I missed an entire section. Oh, well, I guess I can show you this alternative method just for funsies. So this is what I did when I first kind of learned how to do this. But all I did, I made little snakes. And so I just did that. Although this putty is not working great. Um, so I just made little snakes, laid it down, pressed it in. Really just depends. Um, so a couple of things about this type of glazing putty. So this type of glazing putty is a pretty simple com like combination of oil and, and chalk, and they add a little bit for like of, of the drying uh, the drying agent in it because it's a type M glaze. Um, but the kind of interesting part is that so say your putty is super super um, like sticky because this is pretty sticky, but it, it, it can get more sticky. Um, so if it's really sticky then you actually can add a little bit of pure whiting or chalk, um, which you'll see in a hot minute. And then um, you can use that to make it less sticky. So you're, but the critical part is you don't wanna like add a ton. So if you're adding a ton, then you might need to kind of reevaluate what's happening. Maybe it's too hot. Maybe you need to kind of see what's going on. But similarly, if your putty is, it seems like it's really dried out and it's having some issues, then you can actually add more, a little bit of boiled linseed oil to the, the putty um, and in order to kind of like revive it a little bit. Because um, there's always a little bit of air that gets into the containers and stuff, but you, it it's doesn't go completely bad if it's a little bit dry on top. Just add a little bit of extra, extra bit boiled linseed oil. Okay. So now that this is good, so what I'm going to do is very carefully do this. And I'm going to kind of gently kind of center it and drop it down. And so I'm going to take these gloves off because, as, like, you want to try to keep 
a lot of the putty from just like taking over and going on the glass too much. But what I'm ju just very, I'm, this is also gentle as you go, patience. I'm gonna just repeat myself. Um, you're gonna gently push, not in the middle. What you wanna do is you just kind of gently wiggle and press down around the edge. And so maybe I'll show you on the other side. So you gently press down, you're just wiggling it. You don't wanna squish all of the putty out. I'm gonna say that again because it's really important. You don't wanna squish all of the putty out. And if you notice like little breaks, you can kind of sometimes stick a little bit of putty in just to make sure that it's gonna be kind of butted properly. But you wanna push it down just so that it's like has like maybe like an eighth to a sixteenth of putty on the bottom. And so if you're working on a smaller window, so like one I often end up doing is um, <laughs> when you're new to this, I would flip this over, say so all of this wasn't a mess, but you would flip this over and cut off the um, extra glazing that's on the other side and clean that up. The purpose of that is so that you can see how deep and wide that bedding is of the glass, of the bed for where the glass is. Because what you want to do is you're going to glaze it right, right under what, how wide that um, glazing bed is. So, so now we have this. Now what? So we don't get to do glazing right away, but what I do get to show you is one of my favorite tools that is now we get to, you know, we see where my um, glazing plate gun is. It's right down there. Oh, ah, thank you. So this is one of my favorites. And what this is, is this is like an old fashioned glazing point gun. And so there's numerous ways to put glazing points in. There's also numerous types of glazing points. There's large diamonds, slightly smaller diamonds, triangular, which are bigger, but also kind of like push ones that are easier to get in. What you need to kind of know is that not all glazing points are going to work well with your window. The little glazing points, the little trying, uh, diamond points are going to be probably best for this because of the glazing bed is so small. Using something like the um, triangle point one is not going to work quite as well because it's going to be too big. And so I didn't stick the up, I stuck it right into the glazing putty. Um, so kind of the purpose of this is that it's going to be able to um, kind of shoot right into the um, right into the wood itself. But if you don't have one, that's fine because really what you can do is um, just uh, press it in with your with your um, with a you know uh, what's it screwdriver or a um, or, or, or your glazing tool. I'm really only gonna need a couple of these on either side. A couple more. What I'm trying to do is make sure it stays flat because you want it flush against the glass. It makes this going is much faster, but I mean, like I said, not necessary at all. You don't have to have this tool. I mean, a lot of times what I do is I take this little other end and I'll push in glazing points. But for the sake of time, I'm just gonna. You can purchase these. They exist. The Craftsman's blog has a, a shop where they refurbish them. They're sometimes difficult to find. Um, this one, somebody was selling and I was like, they were selling it as a, what is it, a reframing tool for paintings. And I looked at it and I was like, I don't think that's for painting or paintings. Those are a little bit smaller. So now we're done with the that part. Um, so this next part, I'm going to put on just one other, another glove so I can kind of show you a quick method for um, adding more glazing because what we do need now is more glazing where you need to just push kind of some initial amounts of glazing kind of into here. Um, running out of time to show you everything, but kind of what you can do is you can actually just kind of like, this is not the prettiest showing, but what you do is you kind of palm it again and you can kind of just press it in. And what you want is just enough to kind of like get you an initial kind of filling of the um, the, the, the glazing bed. Okay. 
And again, I'm wearing a glove for this mainly because otherwise it just will stick to you. Uh, but there's other ways you can do it with a putty knife. You can do it with, I don't know, whatever. You can use it with your fingers. Really, you're just trying to get this initial layer of a putty down to um, do the kind of like the glazing process with the glazing tool. Thank you all for hanging on here for a minute. Okay. So it's not beautiful right now, but it doesn't have to be. Um, but this is where kind of my starting point is going to be for, for um, just um, doing this kind of first initial run over. So doing this one more quickly, because I do want you all to see it. Um, so kind of like a little, little tip that I have. So you can see, I'm getting a lot of putty stuck to my, to my knife and everything. But the little kind of tip is you have um, your boiled linseed oil handy. Who doesn't? Uh, you can, um, oh, no, um, I made that solid check. Um, but what you can do is put a little uh, linseed, boiled linseed oil on the blade of your glazing tool. Um, and that way, what you can do is um, it just keeps the putty from sticking quite as much. But what I'm gonna do, and when I do this, I like to keep, I like to stand right in front of where I'm working. And I like to keep my wrist locked because what that means is I'm gonna keep, if possible, keep the same angle from start to finish. And I'm gonna do an entire line um, you can't see this, but I'll hopefully be able to show you on the other end. But I cut, I go in at the angle of the corner and I angle it. What I'm going to do is apply pressure and I'm just going to pull all the way down and meet the other corner. When I get here, I'm going to, you know, attempt to make that corner as best as possible. I always end up messing with my corners like after the fact. And so what I then do is I can pull away my putty, my extra putty like this. And what you're looking for is a mostly flat, um, kind of smooth surface. You don't want like too many bumps and everything like that. The thing is with, with glazing, if you try to make it too perfect, you're gonna drive yourself bonkers. What you want is like, you want it to um, be just under the width of the glazing bud. You want your corners to look pretty nice. And um, you want to make sure. So one thing I just did, I cut it too shallow. So what I'm going to do is just press it back in. And what I meant by too shallow is I hit the glazing point. You do not want your glazing points to be to show. So again, I'm keeping my wrist locked, kind of just following that edge. I tend to just, I will kind of just roll up the extra putty, add it to this. You can save that putty as long as it doesn't have a bunch of debris and other stuff in it. Like you can save that putty for later. Um, again, if I can't be right in front of it, there's one guy who says you should really just learn to be like, uh, what is it, ambidextrous, but I'm not quite there. So, um, so what I'm gonna do is just as much as possible, keep my same angle here and just pull along. And this one I'm gonna run into a little bit of palm, so I'm just gonna continue on um, and finish. Karen asked if there's a minimum temperature. Uh, there is. Like that, I, guess. Um, <clears throat> I think Jubilee, there's kind of like a, a, a like best range. Um, I have to look at the container for it. I feel like it's somewhere around 50 degrees, but that's, so one, but some, one, one of my great mentors once said to me, one of the best things you can do is learn to read the box, <laughs> which I find hilarious because I still read the box even though I've like looked at this stuff like so many different times. Um, but uh, it really, it pays to like make sure that you know you're using a product correctly and often they will have the instructions on the back and everything. But um, they do because once the, if the putty gets too cold, then you will not be able to like 
move it. It will like the, the oil will like solidify, just kind of like butter will solidify in your fridge. Um, and so, so yeah, so basically, yes, um, I do believe it's somewhere around like 50 degrees. So when I'm going back through, and so the problem areas are usually always the corners, but when you make your corners all nice and pretty, generally that's what kind of makes it look really nice and, and lovely. But like I said, do not drive yourself nuts about making this like the most perfect corners in the world. You want something that looks nice, looks flat, but it doesn't have to be so perfectly flat because you do have to kind of economize your, your time and everything. And so what I'm doing is just going to clean up my corners, making those a little bit nicer. Um, and yeah, so, so with that said, um, the one great thing about my messiness that I will say is I'll kind of show you kind of one last trick and everything for, um, for kind of how to finish this process up and to kind of make sure your work stays nice once you're, you're done. Um, I'm just gonna clean up this last putty and everything, these little edges. And so yeah, I mean you'll you you'll get in a groove. You'll find like the way you glaze best. And so um, when you do that, you'll find like this is how I like to hold my putty knife. Or I don't like using a glazing tool. I like using a normal putty knife. Um, so you just try things out. See what kind of feels best to you. Um, like I can tell you what I do, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be like the best thing for for you when you're glazing. My dad glazes like this. And I have no idea how he does it. It honestly is like astounded me. Um, I, I will rip out the putty, my beautiful work every time I try. So, and what I'm doing here is like my, um, my glazing putty was like a little thicker than I wanted. And so what I'm doing is I'm just going back over and just doing a quick once over. Um, so yeah, so anyways, you can you can sit here and do this all day, I promise. But yeah, just find where you feel comfortable and you're like, this is good enough. Because sometimes good enough is enough. Um, so anyways, I'm gonna let that happen for there. I'm putting my leftover putty back into my container for later. It's still good. And I'm, the, the other little thing that I tend to do when I'm kind of done with my, um, when I'm done with my glazing is I actually take what I was saying you can add to um, uh, what, what I add to it putty to make it less gut, like I guess sticky is this it's called whiting um, I think there's a lot of potters and the people use it I get mine from the craftsman store but it's really just kind of this white powder powder and the purpose of this is that I'm going to just take it and quickly brush it along my putty that I finished and what this does is going to give you just like an initial little film on top of your putty. And it'll just help it from getting nicked or bumped or anything else. If you use a nice soft bristled brush, sometimes you can like brush out little imperfections as you go. But the other kind of amazing thing about, um, about this, this powder is that this oil that I have in the glass, if I just like it'll make it less sticky, it's because it's soaking up oil. And so what I can do is actually mush it around on this glass and it'll soak up the oils that are on this glass and it'll make it a lot easier because you, once the, the putty, um, once the oil starts um, drying on the glass, what it'll do is get really, really hard and it's just gonna be a lot more difficult to kind of get off over time. So you wanna go over and just kind of try to kind of brush off, like use that extra powder, like uh, whitening so you just kind of brush that um, the oils off your glass. It's just going to make cleanup later a lot easier. Um, so it kind of just serves that dual purpose. And really what you're going to do is you're going to do this on both sides. So you're going to clean that other side as well and clean off any kind of like residue. But we're not going to do that today because I can't flip this over right now. Um, so yeah, so I guess there's kind of like losing a nutshell. Um, can't see so much, so much up close. Okay, and then the other critical point is that you don't wanna leave, you don't necessarily wanna leave um, powder, just like chunks of powder along the edge of 
your glazing, especially in the corners, because it'll eventually kind of adhere itself and soak up the oils in the glazing. You just want just enough powder enough to, um, to yeah, to like to give that kind of film over it. So I'm kind of just brushing it in the middle. What I'll do is I'll just end up um, making sure I've got kind of like the different oils off. And then from there, I'll just suck it up with the, the vacuum and then um, kind of clear the glass off that way. <clears throat> so, um, so we're over time and I don't know how many people are able to stick around, but I can do a little overview of wood rot repair. Um, at least kind of like showing you the different components and talking through it. But if people are ready, just skedaddle, I totally understand as well. Um, how do you feel? If folks need to go, they can go. Okay. Okay, great. So, so that's glazing. We'll leave that there for now. But I'm going to grab our bottom rail of this window, which if you can kind of tell, it's a little punky. It's a little rotten and it has a lot of different issues going on. It's a little soft, but it's a really great example to show where epoxy repairs can be pretty beneficial. Um, so what I'm gonna do for this piece of wood is that I'm going to just show you, like I said, we talked over a little bit the um, how to condition it. And uh, if we have a little more time, I'd show you that method on the other side, but I'm gonna just show the um, rot repair um, right now. Um, and so I'm going to grab my little epoxy bits. Um, so like I said, I tend to use the Abitron system. Um, so liquid wood, see it's a two part system. And so it comes with the two bottles, um, part A and part B. Um, and it's a one to one ratio. And the liquid wood is what we're going to use first. Um, I like to have little cups. These are actually ones my dad gave me off his laundry detergent. Mm -hmm. um, which I actually use, I mean, they work quite well. I have one and this is the one I tend to use to mix them both. But I just really, it doesn't matter how much you mix, you need to mix enough for, um, you just need to mix enough to like saturate the wood that you need to. Um, this is a type of consolidant where you can inject it, like drill a small hole and inject it inside. Um, um, and you can inject it inside. Um, however, um, like you can just like let it kind of soak in as well. So, hard for me to find. I'm just opening up the cans here. Um, yeah, please let me know, like if you have kind of places you think about using like a consolidating epoxy or other kind of raw repair, let me know. Um, really consolidation is one of the best options. I guess like one thing we can talk about a little bit is, you know, when do you know your rot is maybe too much? Like when is it the time where you need to replace your wood? Well, if it's really, it has no integrity and, um, like if this one's still solid, you still have kind of a complete piece of wood. But the bottoms of those two other pieces are so far gone where I could barely touch them and they fall apart. Which you might be able to repair, but sometimes like that's the point where you, you decide that it, it's, it's time to maybe do a wood replacement. Or maybe even replace the, the, the entire wood piece itself. So, sorry about this, I'm just struggling to make sure this thing's open. Um, so basically what I'm gonna do first, once I get these opened, is I'm going to measure, and make sure you keep the tops of your epoxy separated. You don't want to like have one, like if you put the wrong one on the top, then you may end up having the issue of, um, your uh, epoxy having a reaction inside of the um, inside of the uh, the whole container. So, so what I'm doing here is I'm just kind of pouring this up to like the bottom line. I'm gonna set that aside. Grab my B cup. 
And I'm going to put part B into its cup. And pour approximately the same amount into this other container. Okay, so that looks just about right. So I'm going to set those aside. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take my additional little cup here and I'm going to pour them in. And so the key with both this consolidating, penetrating epoxy, the liquid wood, and the wood epox, so like the kind of more malleable epoxy, is that you want to be able to really, really mix these well. You do not want these to like be partially mixed because that renders kind of it ineffective. Like they need to be able to react with one another. And so I'm basically going to take my, my new cup of material, if you can see that. Maybe if I move over here. I'm going to take my little cup of epoxy and I'm going to just mix it and make sure that it's kind of fully integrated with one another. You can kind of see like they're slightly different colors. And so if you're seeing kind of the yellowy part B and the more clear part A, not like kind of swirling, but not integrated, then you know you need to mix it a little bit more. So, so yeah, so basically I'm just mixing, mix, mix, mix. And so we're getting there. Um, so after this, what really what you need to do is like once you get it fully integrated is that you actually need to let it sit for a couple minutes or just sit for a second. And so I'm going to show you the other epoxy while we wait. Um, and that way we'll have that one ready for when uh, we kind of get this kind of into the wood and everything. Okay, so that's looking pretty decent. And if you can kind of see, it's like looking a pretty consistent color and everything. So we're gonna let that sit. Um, just having these kind of disposable gloves is really good for a couple of different reasons. This epoxy is another one of those reasons. Um, because what I tend to do is just like take chunks of it out with my hands um, and then just kind of gauge the size in my hand for like how big the epoxy is. Um, so, and they follow the same system. So like there, for this type of epoxy, again, there is, um, there is going to be a part A and a part B. So we again have the part A and part B. And these feel very light and that's the way they're supposed to be. They always are really, really light, but when they harden, you can sand this material just like you do any other wood. You can cut it, you can shape it. Um, it's actually, it's very, very effective. Um, I've had really good luck with it. I've recreated entire kind of like bottom parts of uh, jams before with, with it. So um, what I tend to do is I tend to scoop a little out in both hands and kind of like, measure the size of um, the little balls that I'm holding. And so I'm just trying to like gauge a little bit like how much I might need to kind of fill these different sections. So I have these two little chunks, so I need a little more brown. These don't need to be so precise but you want them, you want them close. I think uh, if you do, what is it like winged eyeliner, then some people say you want your little winged eyeliner to be sisters, um, but not identical. <laughs> and so you want them to be sisters, they don't have to be identical. Um, but I have now have these two parts, they're about the same size. What I'm gonna do is take them and I'm going to just try to mash them together and they need to also be fully integrated. And so you don't, <clears throat> if you can kind of see in this product a little bit, maybe not so much, it's a little bright, um, but the product is not. You can still see the separation of the two colors, the white and the brown. So similar as the kind of part A and part B of the first part. So 
So as we do this, our other epoxy is sitting. And after we get this kind of integrated, what we'll do is we'll take that other epoxy and actually treat the wood. Honestly, it makes me feel like I'm kind of playing with Play-Doh again. So it's, it's pretty good though. And so you see, I'm really just kind of working it together. This is another thing where kind of like the other, um, kind of like the, um, um, the blazing putty, you want to make sure that you're not doing this at a really cold temperature because again, it's going to like kind of for a different reason, but like the chemical reaction won't happen if it gets too cold, like the chemical reaction would be slow and vice versa, you actually can speed up the, um, the chemical pro the chemical reaction by, um, heating your, um, heating your epoxy. So I can take, uh, actually take my heating gun to this and cause the, um, and cause the epoxy to set more rapidly. And so that's always a kind of an option. Um, if you need something to kind of move more quickly. So we have this side piece here. This is the rot that we're going to kind of deal with. And so I'm going to take my epoxy and um, basically find a way to sit this so I don't get epoxy there. Um, and I'm going to be pretty liberal. So basically I'm going to take this epoxy and I'm going to um, I can't see that very well. I'm going to take this epoxy and just um, basically uh, drip it onto the bottom of this piece of wood. And because this piece of wood is pretty, has like some funky pieces and different things like that, it's going to kind of suck into this wood and kind of um, consolidate it. It's going to kind of stop the deterioration from happening and it's going to kind of penetrate into this wood piece. You sometimes have to be a little patient because like for it to like kind of penetrate properly, it's going to um, just take a second to, to kind of work its way into the wood. And you're, you'll notice there is no finish on this side. I went and sanded this a little bit just to make sure that it was going to um, let the you know epoxy penetrate effectively. So I'm just going to follow my way along here. And you're going to notice like you're going to come back to that front piece and front part of the piece and you're going to say oh wow like it almost looks dry again and that's when you know you need to add a little bit more so when you add the other epoxy the um, moldable epoxy is when this is kind of like when i talked about conditioning the wood um, when it's kind of you know not taking in the epoxy anymore and just is a slightly tacky This. So yeah, I mean, it's a pretty easy process. Um, they actually sell little kits with both the penetrating epoxy and the um, the penetrating epoxy and the moldable epoxy all in one, depending how big your project is. So, um, and they always come with instructions. And it's, I, I think the one of the reasons I always recommend them, A, I mean, the product is always held out very well for me, but also because, um, it is so friendly. They make it easy to kind of understand um, how to use their product and have it used kind of effectively. Um, Karen asked, does the rotted wood area need to be dry for the epoxy to apply, or can you apply it to rotted areas that are still sticking? No. Yeah. So the first, the first of those two options. Um, so that's the, that's really actually pretty critical. Is that the wood really needs to be dry? So I took this window out. I think I took this window out on Saturday and so I've had it inside and drying so that when we came to do this class, the epoxy would um, penetrate effectively. If there's water in there, it's just, it's not allowing, it's not going to allow the uh, chemical process to take place, the chemical reaction, um, and it actually may like uh, cause it to completely stop um, working. And so it does need to be dry, it's sometimes difficult. I also, um, I know that there was a question a while ago, I don't think I ever answered it, about what you do when you take your windows out um, and like how to cover them, which is rather funny because I did have to do that here. Um, and so what I generally use is like, um, 
you can go to like Menards or Home Depot or whatever, and you can buy like sheet plastic. And what I do is I usually just put it up there with um, painter's tape. So if it's not gonna be like too long of a wait and everything, then I'll probably, I generally just kind of use some painter's tape. Um, besides that, I mean, if it's gonna be up longer, you actually will, I would, you know, you can, you know, put um, tacks up or staple it, depending on kind of the wood surrounding it. I generally try to use tape most of the time, so it doesn't, um, uh, just because I really don't like to mar wood if I don't have to. So this is really punky, this end part. And so one thing, a really great way to think about wood is kind of like a bunch of straws stuck together. And so the way water gets in and is kind of most damaging is like when it gets sucked up by the ends. And that's why those bottoms pieces of the, the bottom part of those side rails are so affected most often. And it's because they just are sucking up the water up into these straws, these capillaries, um, doing what they're supposed to do, but what you really don't want them to do. Um, and so you have to be mindful. But when you put epoxy in, think about it the same way. So how can you get this epoxy to kind of penetrate a little further? Well, you can actually have it soak up and in these end, end grain parts. So that's what I'm doing. I'm just gonna kind of continue on a little bit. I'm gonna just kind of dribble a little bit on this other side, just to make sure that it's kind of penetrating through the piece. So, so really when this hardens, it'll really harden um, and then the punkiness of the wood will go away. The softness of it will go away. Um, and so yeah, that's the consolidating property. But what the um, malleable part of this does really is going to fill in the gaps that no longer have wood in it because of the deterioration. So always try to keep this off your skin too. I mean, it's just not very good to kind of get these kind of materials there. Um, so this is looking pretty great. Um, it's so thin, it's slightly tacky. Um, the wood seems like it's soaked it up relatively well. <clears throat> so we're gonna let that sit for a hot second. I always end up making too much penetrating epoxy, I swear. So, so this is sitting for a minute. And so what we're gonna do now and now that this epoxy is going to set up for just a second, um, we're just gonna need to wait for it to get tacky. Once it's kind of just tacky, that's when you can go back in and start kind of pushing in the um, uh, multiple epoxy. Um, so. He's just like one more minute. Um, when you're doing this multiple epoxy, one thing I always try to suggest to people is, um, um, I would try to suggest to people often that, um, you overfill things because you can always take some of this away, but you can't always, uh, it's hard to kind of add it back in. So overfill, and then you can always cut it away, sand it away, everything like that. Um, because it's it's pretty easy. This this makes it easy. It's almost easier to kind of work with than you know actual wood. Um, and so what I'm doing here is just pressing it in to kind of the, the space. And I'm just going to kind of use it to recreate. So one thing I notice here, there's like little weep holes, and so I want to make sure I don't press it too much into that weep hole. And so I'll kind of go back and take that out. Um, but yeah, so you can use these to kind of create new elements. What's really great about it is it's really great for creating like a little more detailed profiles or kind of like other things. Like you can really, add, you can add texture to it if you want it to look like it has like wood grain. I mean, it's just as kind of overall just can um, really be effective at, um, I guess, rebuilding some uh, a section that is kind of brought it away. Um, and in tandem with the other epoxy, it often means that, um, um, and with the other epoxy and everything, um, it means that it'll generally attach pretty well too. So like these epoxies are working together as a system. So I'm just kind of working this along the edge, um, kind of filling in different gaps. So yeah, so I'm overfilling it. 
So I can always go back and take some away. I mean, you don't want to leave giant extra chunks there, but you also want to like make sure that you're making enough so you can make the, the shape that you want. It doesn't really shrink. And so generally kind of the shape you mold it into is the shape you end up with after. So, so yeah, some people like to learn with the putty knife. I often just shove it in with my fingers and kind of go back later and kind of smooth it out. So yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. Um, that's mostly, that's pretty much the entire process. And it's pretty simple. There's a lot of different videos online. I'll make sure to include some just in case you missed it or wanted to see something that's a little, a little more up close and everything. So. So yeah, so if there's any additional questions, please let me know. Any kind of skills that you missed, I'll make sure we include so you all can see it. This stuff always ends up taking longer than I always end up expecting it to. So. So, and with that, I think I've put enough epoxy, kind of got on nooks and crannies. But, but yeah, it's just a really versatile, versatile product. Oop. Did you say how long it would take for it to set? Oh, yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, so this will, I mean, sometimes, depending on the weather, so hotter temperatures means it's going to set more quickly. Um, uh, cooler temperatures will take a little bit longer, but I mean, generally, I think the liquid wood is for sure set I, two days, I think at its hardest, usually by the end of a week. Um, and this, and you know, you can almost, uh, sometimes I come back and the, uh, the moldable epoxy has been dry enough in the summer where I could go back and use it or um, shape it or paint it. Um, like within 24 hours, depending on where you're at. So, okay. yeah, so I think that's pretty much it. Those other things, I'm, I'm happy to include those, um, some extra material so y'all can see um, any other restoration things or just feel free to send me an email and I'd be happy to like walk through anything or answer any questions, um, but taking up so much of your time all. And I really appreciate it though. I'm glad to see more people really interested in saving and restoring their windows instead of replacing. Um, it's, a, it's a passion of mine and I'm glad to see others are also really happy to do the same. Oops. Well, thank you everybody so much for joining. We'll sign off here in a few minutes. Feel free to hang out if you have any remaining questions um, and we'll be sending out the um, recording of the class and um, the resource packet that Laura mentioned. So you'll have all of these links um, and, and references for you uh, to take home. So thank you again. Thanks for staying late. Appreciate it. Um, and many thanks to everyone here at the Cox House, Jessica, um, for, for hosting us here. So please do join us next week if you can. Our last class in the series is all about drafting a maintenance plan for your home. So taking all that we've learned and putting it into practice um, for your seasonal and annual uh, repairs and maintenance to do's. So thank you, everybody. Have a good afternoon. So... Sure.